Hello. Hey, Doug. Hey, Matt. Get my video on here. There it goes. Uh oh, wrong camera. Hold on. <laughs> oh, you're fancy with your cameras. There we go. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hey. Yeah, you too. Well, thank yeah. you for taking the time to to connect with me, and uh, I I do have a bit of an idea of how I want to engage with you today, um, and just kind of appeal to your uh, your thoughts. As I had been listening into Whitehead, I, I first got familiar with Whitehead back in um, graduate school. I went to Boston College, um, and. I did a master's in theology in addition to um, clinical social work. And so I remember reading a few articles, but I mean, I was just so inundated with all kinds of stuff. I didn't get to really go into it. Are you there? Okay. Um, yeah. And then, uh, but re reconnecting with Whitehead through you and other people, um, I really do get a sense that Whitehead and the law of one are are complete are really congruent now i've been steeped with the law of one material um, now for about 13 years and i've not had a chance to really talk to a philosopher um because i guess the timing wasn't right until now about how i understand the cosmology and cosmogenesis uh, given the law of one and i wanted just to share some of those insights with you and then see what what might be congruent there from your perspective or interesting at least. Um, so in part, it's yeah. good. It's nerdy. It's going to be super nerdy, <laughs> but that's, that's fine with me. <laughs> yeah. I'm a nerd. Um, and yeah, I don't know too much about, um, the law of one. I mean, I'm familiar with it sort of in general and, um, haven't myself kind of gone deep into, channeled material of any kind though i do find it um i'm open epistemologically to the possibilities of such uh transmission let's say um and i think there are various ways of understanding it that um would make sense to me you know so i'm, I'm eager to learn more about the connections that, that you have found uh, yeah. with whitehead's cosmology so yeah let's let's go there okay the uh, I don't typically um, delve into channel material in general, um, but this particular uh, material I was in, introduced a few years ago, about ten years, and it um, it affirmed everything I'd already kind of known at a deeper intuitive level, but it also uh, corroborated a lot of the stuff that I had gone through in the mystical Christian search. Um, plus good psychology. And so I kind of hold it as uh, a paradigm or the, a really high uh, place in my mind as to which I compare other philosophies or material. Not to say that it is un not distorted. There's distortions there. And in fact, the, the source of it claimed that they're not enlightened and they're still on the journey too, which I like. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to jump in. What I was thinking of doing is... Uh, sharing with you for a few minutes on how I understand cosmogenesis and cosmology from the law of one, get your take on that. Um, mm -hmm. And then it, what I'm hoping happens is that um, we, the conversation kind of moves into um, a sense of praxis, a sense of like what your thoughts are in uh, taking concepts and making them incarnated here in, in, in the form of loving service to see what the world can be in that way. As you, I think you've alluded somewhere in your, in some of your interviews that you feeling a nice invitation in your life, maybe to kind of think of that too. Is, is that right? Like how it looks yeah, yeah. from not just a conceptual way, cause you got that dialed down, but then what does it look like in a praxis way? That's right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, essential right now and I, I really do um feel responsible as you know as an academic i do scholarly work and it's not always as accessible but i also want to make sure that i can translate that into something that can be relevant to to everyday people who, who care about 
what reality is and and how they fit into it so yeah yeah one of the things that the law of one says is that uh everything takes place in the eternal now um but for the sake of uh, understanding it from our perspective they the source and the source is named ra r a um ra says that they um that, that from our vantage point there is linear time and that linear time does exist too it's just that uh at at a more expanded level it is taking place in kind of an eternal now i i understand that somewhat conceptually but it's not compressed <laughs> to use whitehead's word into a gnosis or to something where i can really feel into that well that's that's the operative concept for whitehead though the concrescence is in some sense um a kind of temporal eternity we'd have to say which is to say it's it's his attempt to integrate uh linear time with 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 the eternal um and so the concrescence happens at various levels various scales in a kind of holographic nested way but ultimately there is one concrescence which we are all ingredients within which is the divine concrescence and that concrescence is everlasting and doesn't perish and it's eternal and it's it's, uh, it's eternal and it's existing yeah. in some level of simultaneity in some way or is that what white does whitehead go there too cuz i know that he talks about process mm-hmm. uh does he give a place for simultaneity or how does that how does he he wants to be able to say that that the, that the divine concrescence is eternal and yet it is growing with the historic unfolding okay. of the universe. All right, well let me get into this cuz that that is one of the questions that I have for you and I uh cuz Ra Ra would take that include um my kid may be calling me and if I do I have to they're at home alone hopefully not burning mm-hmm. anything down or killing anybody. Uh <laughs> and uh Ra would include that but there's a space for um well, there's a space for some things that that Whitehead doesn't say, and so I'm just curious about that. So as as our conversation unfolds, anyways, some of this I'm going to read. Can I just ask briefly, yeah, quickly? Uh, Ra does Ra present him her itself as as a sun god, like akin to uh, the Egyptian, or is this a solar logos deity, or what's what's? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, give me three minutes to talk about the who it Ra sure. is, perhaps. Okay. Um, yeah. Ra is a um, if if God has if we have chakras and energy centers, then and if uh, you know as above so below, then there's a way in which that which transcends us and includes us also has chakras, and those chakras are called densities. Densities, or at least in the law of one, densities in terms of how dense love and light is compacted. Um, and there are different bandwidths of consciousness that build upon each other, just like our chakras do. It's like a, um, a spiral that gets ever more expanded. And the, um, we are in earth where it's a third density planet. Well, Ra would be a sixth density, what's called a social memory complex, or you could call it a compressed society, um, I guess. And it's, it's a united organism of billions of souls that through the process of natural evolution uh, become one and act as one even if there are individuated uh, sentient beings within the one but they're united at a level of gnosis um, yeah that we wouldn't know and so Ra came um, they responded to a call of humanity at a certain time in our own evolution of waking up f- to the sense that um, third density with a veil and I'm, I'm jumping ahead I'll come back to the cosmogenesis but third density has, has a veil in it of we don't know that we are one with everybody and we don't know that we are one with God that there's a way in which this veil of forgetting is uh, placed between the unconscious and conscious and there's there's an absolute purpose for that and that causes a sense of um, confusion in third density beings at a certain level of their evolution. So a call for aid comes and uh, Ra talks about how 
the one infinite creator is like a being with one body. And so just as you have a, maybe a cut on your leg and you would have to address that, we are a cut on the leg, let's say, through our calling out to which Ra would be, in, uh, I guess you could call it God's active uh, service. <laughs> um, but the, but the social memory complex and it originally, uh, they, when they came, according to Ra, when they came amongst the Egyptians, um, they felt that they could be in congruence with at that time what the Egyptians saw as the sun god, the sun disk, because the Egyptians knew or mm. sort of intuited at that time that the that the sun, the way they understood the sun was in congruence with the law of one, in congruence with unity and union. Um, and that congruence matched the congruence of Ra's own self consciousness and so since there was a paired unity they didn't infringe upon the free will of the egyptians to come and work with them directly as they had been worked on when they were in third density by other more advanced beings and so um but over time uh they, they underestimated and they admit this the uh, complexity of the human third density con the earth third density consciousness and things got distorted really quickly into um, kind of a power play where the kings and queens, you know, it was more to the negative polarity, the service to self. Um, sorry, what Ra's messages and in the, in the gifts that Ra tried to give to humanity were then co-opted by an elitist um, side of kind of way to then dominate uh, um, people. And therefore, when one says Ra, oftentimes there can be, you know, these are the bad guys or whatever. Sometimes that is that thought. Um, but according to Ra's own statement is that they're now trying to help balance out the thought forms that they had created uh, by intervening or interfere, not intervening. Yeah, intervening with humanity. And then those thoughts then and their interventions get distorted and a karmic kind of trail leads on. So yeah, when Ra is the um, connected with the Egyptians, but um, it's not as probably the lore would say. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, take that with a grain of salt, big, big old thing of salt. Um, the infinity, the, you know, the first known thing Ra says is that infinity um, became aware. And the, this awareness led, so you have God with the lights off, which is infinity without becoming aware. And then infinity becomes aware. Uh, and with, this is like God with the lights on. And Ra calls this intelligent infinity. And awareness sort of leads, it's, it's kind of like it starts this spiral, um, Whitehead's con process of concrescence, you know. And it starts this spiral of awareness that um, Ra calls it at this early primal stage, uh, and I guess you could call it the primal god, doesn't it? Doesn't uh, Whitehead primordial god or primordial god or prim um, primal god? Yeah, this would yeah, be kind primordial of primordial nature of God. Yeah. Yeah. So this would be, um, I think, akin to that, and the awareness at this level is Ra calls it intelligent energy. So this is a subtle nuance from intelligent infinity. Intelligent infinity would be um, pure, pure potentiality without any hue, without any differentiation, pure white light. And then intelligent energy is this creative principle, um, which Ra calls uh, love, intelligent energy and creative principle. At this level, that's Ra conflates them all. Um, and the, the first, when awareness came and starts to cycle, the, what Ra calls the original thought starts to manifest. And that original thought is basically one thing. And we are all a part of this original thought. And that is um, experience of God's self. God experiencing God's self. So there's a primacy of experience, as, as Whitehead might say, pan-experientialism, I think you might 
I've said that too. Uh, the primacy of experience through cr- the creative principle, like that's it. And mm-hmm. then um, awareness kind of comes to some sort of crystallized vortex, if you will. There's a crystallization where some uh, uh, consciousness comes alive at that point. Um, so awareness is a bit differentiated from consciousness in a sense. And consciousness at the level of the logo, this kind of level would be consciousness of um, the birth of some kind of beinghood, uh, some kind of permanence, a permanent concrescence, if you will, that stays there. And uh, Ra calls this the primal logos. So the primal logos is, in a sense, the creator of all that there is, but in some way, it is uh, even a child or a beget a begotten of um, the initial infinity awakening, um, and so the primal logos is a is a is a concrescence, if you will, of it's it's the um, spiral coming down to some level of crystallization, and then a logos would be love at a, at the level of personhood, but personhood not in in terms of like God is a white male up there. Um, I think God is a black woman. Just kidding. Uh, I think God as um, if the word person. I th- I'm sure you're familiar. It comes from the Greek uh, personare, and, and this idea of that it's a sounding through, that that infinity is able to sound through itself through some sort of stable beingness. Uh, mm-hmm. Is kind of how I guess personhood is understood um, by Ra. So therefore, we have um, the primal logos would be that would be what I would understand as Whitehead talking as everything is in process because the primal logos is becoming as the entire universe goes through its evolution. So uh, thanks for laying this out. It's very, very uh, fascinating. And I, I think I do sense the correlations with whitehead but i was reading the primal logos more in terms of what whitehead calls the the initial aim um or the the initial eros eros mm-hmm. um which would be the way that the primordial nature of god um participates in the experience of each creature of each finite actuality as a source of Whitehead says relevant novelty, and so this this if if this correlation is is uh, accurate, it would it would mean that the primal logos is a sort of um, it, it functions in each moment of our experience as a kind of whisper of what the most ideal choice would be for us to make in that situation, and uh, but is not determining what choice we make. There's freedom there, um, and Whitehead describes this the the role of this initial aim or initial eros as god holding up a mirror to each creature to reveal to it its own greatness its own possible greatness like hey you you could you could do this right and then it's up to us to decide the extent to which we we do that um and there is still freedom though for each creature to to decide not to actualize the highest most beautiful ideal in each moment and indeed um much of much of the contingency and what from a religious point of view we would call evil in the world is a result of our freedom to to not do exactly as god suggests Mm -hmm. yeah that's good um what ra would say on that is the the primary arrows which i love Elia delio's work on this and of course dehar de chardin and um, is this idea that uh, with the onset of awareness and then the the movement into what Ra would call the primal logos, there there was an automatic at that point uh, result of that, and that result was with the original thought, which is to experience oneself. It necessitates an original desire, which is the um, telos that is the ultimate telos and the ultimate telos is that all entities seek and become one and so that seeking and becoming one 
um, is the eros. It's it's the pulling together to compress all you know into societies and greater and greater um, gestalts. You know the what is it? The many become one, and then are uh, plus increased one, by increased one, by yeah. one. Yeah, the the force behind that would be the original desire. Uh, and the way that I have written about this is, uh, from a visual standpoint, that is the torrid field. You know, it's this sense of going in and coming back yeah. out, um, and everything would be kind of a hologram or hol a holon of a, a tor that torrid field. Everything is a torrid field within torrid fields and just goes on <laughs> into this yeah. greatest wholeness. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I, I don't know that I could do better than that, that image. Uh, the, the, the Taurus really does capture this universal dynamic of the, of, of, of a movement, um, into and through and back out of and back into again, mm -hmm. this, um, this oneness, right. Um, and it can apply, uh, it's, it's, it's almost, yeah, it's holographic. Right. It applies to the whole and then to each of the apparent parts, which are themselves sort of recapitulations of the whole. Because, um, yeah, Whitehead also has what he calls the consequent nature of God. And again, similarly to similar to what you're describing, he, he says that the primordial nature of God is not conscious. Mm -hmm. God only becomes conscious in the consequent pole as a result of relationship to the world mm -hmm. that's uh, right that's what Ra would say too yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of but the, one of the screen. things I think Ra would subtle, make a nuance on that is consciousness for Ra um, or you, one might say the world uh, has a spectrum of, of becoming and so Ra spends some time in the material talking about um, what happened before there was actual physical manifestation, that there was a kind of metaphysical groundwork that was played out in timelessness from our perspective, but it could have been eternity too. I mean, but anyways, there was a way in which um, actually God incarnating as the photon or as matter, that first what we would say step into manifestation was actually itself um, a series of lots of uh, actual occasions um, perishing. And then, so that first consciousness for Ra, uh, the world, if you will, would have been to become aware and then desire to experience itself. And that would, that first thought, if you will, would have been the first creation through which then that's the prism through which the white light then shines in and gets these different hues. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, yeah, I don't know if Ra's that anyways, that's just kind of how I understand it. I could be really off. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> let me uh, keep going just for a second here. Um, so I, I want to say that the telos as the universal, I mean, the original desire is always unified diversity. It, that is the, um, I guess in, in Christianity we would call that the Holy Spirit but it is eros, it's divine eros that pulls things together and then we as holons um, recapitulating as you, I mean Ross says that like directly like uh, every holon is a recapitulation of the great holographic nature of God of the creator they say but uh, interestingly too and I, I think I might have heard you say it I'm not sure but um, Ra talks about how there's a way in which the the creator, I, maybe you would call it the, uh, I don't know if it's the primal logos or the uh, the consequent God, but regardless, there's a sense in which it kind of does it in reverse, or no, we do it in reverse to it because there's a way in which uh, we are recapitulating in reverse our uh, discovery of awareness. There has to be um, a, a telos just in front of us, that, that eros that calls us forward to then manifest, make decisions using free will and manifest into in, incarnated embodiment. 
um, yeah. that according to our desire. Does that make sense? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this is akin to Whitehead's sense that um, in some ways, God's concrescence occurs in the reverse order to how finite occasions of experience can crest. We mm-hmm. finite occasions begin in their physical pole mm-hmm. and inherit a past. And then the mental pole uh, supplements that inheritance with, with novelty. Whereas with God, God begins with the mental pole, you could say. Yeah. With this kind of, kind of conceptual realization um, or appetition or or uh, evaluation of, of the realm of infinite possibility. And then God's physical pull would be the consequent um, pull of God, which which is feeling how all of the finite actualities decide to respond to the primordial pulls, conceptual realization. So there's a kind of inversion there. Uh, it's a bit it's a little bit more complicated than that because there are some ways in which why well, I, I could just briefly yeah, say please even finite occasions of experience, because we are um, in our physical pole, Whitehead says, each finite occasion is feeling the initial aim of God, the primal logos, if you want, or the, the initial eros. Mm-hmm. We're, we, we feel that in our physical pole. Um, and it sort of uh, sets the concre- concrescence in motion. And so to that degree in which we are feeling God's mental pole in our physical pole, which Whitehead calls a hybrid preemption, even our concrescence works in the same order as God's. Okay. It's just the only difference here still is that God doesn't have a history. Yeah. God's, God's um, conceptual evaluation or appetition in response to infinite possibility is, is eternal. There's no past that God needs to conform with or worry about. Right. Whereas for us, yeah. we, we do have a history. I, I, that might be what Ra talks about means in terms of um, e- the eternal present. What you just said, that might be the way they understand that. Mm-hmm. That's a really good way to look at because it, it's eternal and there is no past or pre- future. Um, therefore, it is irrelevant to talk about. I mean, the present right. would just be our English word to put there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank in, you. In Whitehead's, in Whitehead's scheme, there is this sense in which... Um, I mean, creativity is his ultimate category, and God is a creature of creativity. Mm-hmm. And Whitehead seems to argue that while there is this aspect of God that's eternal, there's something, it's precisely because of the the unrest and the, the perpetual advance of creativity that God has a consequent nature. Yes. And so God remains eternal, but God also has this historical dimension of growth and so like Whitehead doesn't want to say that the historical process is an illusion as though it were extraneous to God's nature he's like no God's nature includes history but transcends it yeah that is how Raw talks about it and I've spent a lot of my time um, writing on for some reason my particular vocation in some ways is to connect with the new age folks I don't know uh because there's so much from my biased perspective judgment of course there's a lot of spiritual bypassing in so far as not um seeing that the manifested world is actually the great jewel i mean that is the way god fully expresses i mean it's all here right now the plenum of god is is right here in this tree in front of me you know um in my body in this moment and uh God, and so Ra does talk about, and I think that's the glory of God, that every moment is is the greatest glory, sacramental nature of, of the present moment is God uh, experiencing God's self at the highest holy levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I should just say here, um, there's so many millions of people inspired by New Age material, mm-hmm. right? Whether, whether it's the Ra and the... the Law of One, or um, mm. whatever. I don't. I don't even need to mention the yeah. other ones, but I don't want to leave anyone out because someone will be like, "Hey, you forgot." Yeah. But um, that those sorts of new religious movements and and spiritual, but not religious movements, if, if you want to put it that way, are so important now because mm-hmm. uh, institutional 
traditional religions are failing us Mm -hmm. and but but it is kind of the wild west right because if you lose institutions then you on the one hand you lose the dogma but then it's also kind of a free-for-all and it's like well anything goes right and who's the authority and how do you decide what's bs versus what's what's legitimate insight into the nature of spirit and 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 reality but i i what what bothers me is how so many people who are more inclined to whatever the science is or a more practical outlook on life will dismiss this stuff as Mm -hmm. as nonsense or wishful thinking or whatever as if they don't also in some way or one way or another uh have a metaphysics or have some kind of um you know way of justifying that getting out of bed in the morning to lead a meaningful life yeah. you know and so i i really do think as a you know as an academic philosopher we need to find i need to find ways of integrating and translating these sorts of ideas so that they can be taken seriously and so that we can begin to you know in taking them seriously develop criteria for adjudicating and 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 judging ultimately you know what is what is beneficial what what serves human flourishing what is more or less epistemologically justified and and what what sort of epistemology could we even develop that would allow us to um to filter out what maybe is is less valid right oh, man. this is, this is yeah. super important work right yeah i i I, that you've just described my my vocation right now nice. um, yeah and but the weird for me it's um it's a, always a span of the conventional and the cause the cosmic or the galactic or you could say exoteric and esoteric for me there's mm. it's it's um of one thread uh seamless garment if you will and what i'd say to to that is that's what I spend my counseling doing a lot of times, um, especially people who come in or more new agey is uh, for them just to put it in a little bit of new age terms is they have maybe a real desire from past lifetimes or, or whatever uh, to work and hone in on their higher chakras, but their root chakras are absolutely not stable um, because I know spiral dynamics is not uh, is, is sort of becoming out of favor in the meta modern verse, um, but that was my first uh, entree into that. So I'm a little bit more familiar with that language. But to put it d- in a spiral dynamics way, um, a lot of green people who are attempting to become yellow. Are you familiar with the spiral dynamics n- nomenclature? Yes. Okay, yeah. maybe a lot of green people are attempting to become yellow, uh, really neglected, and they have a shadow in the blue, the red and the blue. And, and so I have to spend time with them actually honing in, loving the traditional values, the blue, the red, the, the, even their arrows and their, their physical embodiment. And so for me, what I tell people is you, with them is, is, you know, the actual way up here, the, the way to ascension, because everybody wants to talk about ascension. So the way to ascend is actually to incarnate more fully right now. And let's talk about how to do that. And so it'll yeah. be um, a lot of traditional work where discipline comes in and, um, and looking at God, not only because these people are really, really ready to understand God, rightly so, as uh, not something different ontological, ontologically than me, uh, something that may transcend me. But nevertheless, it's kind of an ephor- uh, ephemeral um, awakening and energy and so on and so forth. But when I'm dealing with people that need to strengthen their lower chakras, um, it's imperative for me at least, and I haven't found a better way, is to help them perceive God from a relational standpoint. Um, That there's a way in which I can pitch and God catches and throws back and there is a dialogue because I think it's through the, um, the medium of heart to heart connections at the heart chakra level really where you get an ability to hone in on uh, defining who am I against a thou to whom I'm giving myself. There's a surrendering that happens 
um, and a relational piece that happens. Anyways, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any thoughts, sir? Yeah, I think a lot of spirituality uh, and a lot of, frankly, also evangelical Christianity that's that's more about waiting for the rapture is this up and out sort of cosmology. And I think it neglects the extent to which the, the physical embodiment and human life on earth is uh, essential for the further evolution of spirit. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, as I often like to, to think of it, like the angels look up to human beings That's right. and find the fact that we can die quite mysterious. And uh, they, they, just as we want to live forever, they want to die. They want to know what that's like. And they, you know, um, and, and so we think of the spiritual world as though it's um, just above us in some sense. And that all we should want to do is get up there. But the spiritual world's trying to get down here. Um, and so this incarnational vector, this, this sense of um, recognizing the importance, the cosmic importance of learning what only we can learn as embodied human beings as a result of the mystery of death, um, that, that, that's what we're here to do. And so um, trying to escape that and dismiss it as Maya or whatever is um, not actually furthering the evolution of spirit, right? It's stepping out of the evolutionary process. And I think and so, causes a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now, you know, writ large. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let yeah. me, let me, um, spend just, cause I, I want to be very mindful of time and I, I want to get your opinion on some other things. Cause I'm going to, where I'm about to go, I don't think Whitehead goes. And so I want to see what your thoughts in terms of your way to understand things might, how you weigh in on this. Um, one of the things that Ross says is, <clears throat> Even though God, uh, let's say, uh, is experiencing God's self through embodiment and incarnation and, and the evolution, um, how evolution, God's own evolution, has been an ongoing experimentation whereby um, there are, there's a way in which an infra infrastructure was a part of that evolution, but the infrastructure was kind of put at least in it's beyond in thought. It's, it, it, it exists as, I guess you could call it eternal objects from a white Handian standpoint. Um, and I'm not sure how to put it into his place, but what raw, <clears throat> what raw would say is that there is a, uh, a system of seven densities as we mentioned earlier, and these are bandwidths of consciousness. Now they all are a spectrum of manifestation, but there's a way in which there's a qualitative difference, almost a quantum jump between uh, a certain level of threshold that one gets into a, a certain density. And then you are moved into the next one in order to uh, be able to experience the next lessons of love that are afforded by that bandwidth of consciousness. So for example, um, you know, a rock ha is, is as much as God as an amoeba, but there's a qualitative difference there, even though we could map out the spectrum in which the amoeba evolutionary become, comes from amino acids and whatnot. Um, and so Ra says like the first density would be uh, the elements and the elements, uh, th these are entities, uh, air, fire, earth, water, they all learn to shape each other and they learn to be individuated. Um, and then there's a movement into second density and that spans the spectrum between, you know, the, the prokaryotic cell all the way to uh, advanced second density beings, which raw, believe it or not, actually li lists out four types of uh, second density beings that actually can get enough self awareness that that's the prerequisite of th certain threshold of self awareness to move into third density. And those four beings are uh, um, the most common would be animal. Um, the second are, are actually plants. 
uh, you can have a sense of an old soul in a tree, you know, or something like that, especially if they've been around uh, other third density beings. Third density beings can actually, if you will, awaken self-awareness in certain second density upper echelons. Um, and, and in rare cases, you have minerals, uh, diamonds, perhaps, or some jewels that are coveted that can gain some level of sentient awareness enough to then move into uh, third density conditions. And then the, the very rarest type, Ra says, and this is the only time they ever talk about it, are actual um, places. So I'm thinking something like the Taj Mahal or some place, even some sacred space where rituals and different things have occurred enough and there's enough enough relationship that have formed between third density beings, humans, and then the second density areas that they actually gain some level of self-awareness. Uh, but what Ross says is once they reach a certain threshold, they don't, upon cessation, return back to undifferentiated consciousness of their species, say, and they move into um, the third density level of consciousness, which is the human being. Mm -hmm. And the human being goes through um, basically three stages. Uh, the first stage is where the self-aware being is more animal-like in terms of its discovery of uh, itself. And only after successive uh, incarnations does it actually begin to learn that there is such a thing as needs other than the survival needs um, that would be useless in terms of survival but are nonetheless become more and more important and Ross says at that level at that point a being does the one thing that is the requirement of third density and that is to make a choice of polarity and the choice of polarity um, is something that the being at an un or subconscious way knows. There's a gnosis of the reality of um, evolution, like ev evolution in terms of development of spirit. That, that becomes, uh, the light bulb goes on and a person then makes a choice of, well, do I go positive in terms of wholeness, moving towards the path of all path of wholeness and unity or do i choose the service to self the negative polarity that uh actually sees the positive path is less efficient and more folly and they they really do and it's only 10 percent. ross says you know the population or so but will choose this path of ever purposeful choice of self upon others in terms of manipulation and that itself actually creates its own pathway forward to fourth density um, because both the positive and the negative are paths to study love love of others including self and love of self with the excluding others but both are the one infinite creator and the the choice of polarity is imperative because this creates mutual catalyst, um, which creates an incredibly intense and vivid experience in third density that doesn't exist in, in any other densities or after either. Just the third density is, is 100 times more intense because of this, um, this polarity that happens. And then, and that's, be, and that's because we have what's called the veil of forgetting, uh, where we, we, are, we are God who doesn't understand that we are God and that is a very holy thing the veil even though it's caused a lot of problems and suffering it's a holy thing because this is what angels long for you know this sense of how can I be God and not know that and wow what an experience that is and then I'll just I'll quit here but I would just want to say then the, uh, the the third phase for the human in third density after making the choice of polarity and this is where most humans are stuck at, uh, according to the law of one. And that is, uh, once you make a choice of polarity at a found foundational, then you have a metaphysical, uh, I guess, concrescence into a new gestalt that is still in third density, but it's of a different quality within third density of beinghood. And here, 
the thrust is your polarity. And so choices that we make uh, are governed by what Ra calls the law of responsibility, that once you make a choice of polarity, that your actions have to, in some way, incarnate your own choice of love, and that you are into loving service. And when that happens, we reach a certain threshold of being able to hold love and light together or access of the heart chakra where we see holistically ourselves and other people. And at that point, we are, Ra calls it uh, harvestable. That's a word that Ra used. There's reasons for it. I won't get into it. But uh, harvestable to fourth density um, lessons because the fourth density lessons of love and light, which the earth is moving into, <laughs> is... Um, there's no veil. And so words will be chosen if we desire. Uh, it'll be mostly, are you familiar with Robert Monroe? No. Mm, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Mm. You know, it'll be more like just being able to share rotes, R O T E S that that was Monroe's concept of telepathy, where I give you a, my own thought form of an experience and you somehow ingest it or put it on and you experience as if you are me. Uh, and that will be a, a total transparency begins in fourth density, which is a qualitatively different uh, co bandwidth of consciousness that we're experiencing now. Anyways, I'm going to pause here and just ask you to weigh in and see if this is maybe it's this new age hocus pocus to you. I don't know. <laughs> Could be. No, I, you know, I so I have to sort of branch away from Whitehead a bit here to connect with what you've shared mm. into Steiner. Yeah. Um, but I certainly sense the resonance between what you've shared here about these different densities and, and what Steiner says is coming out of theosophy about the mineral, etheric, astral, and, and he calls it ego, eek in German, the I. And, and then there's, there's three stages of further spiritual development beyond that. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think Whitehead, there's nothing in Whitehead's cosmology which would prevent us from um, pursuing these sorts of, of spiritual accounts of, of the makeup of manifest reality. Um, and I think we might say that the, the higher densities or uh, the, um, in Steiner's sense, these other bodies that are yet to fully evolve or maybe not yet manifest they're kind of the potential unmanifest awaiting our um realization of them um but they are possibility they're definite possibilities that we're striving to to sort of uh in involute or ingress if we want to use whitehead's term. yeah um and i think the way you're describing this 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 stage where we're kind of in the as human beings in this we're astral beings with this capacity for I-hood, beinghood, and that this brings in this moral dimension and are, are striving to take responsibility for our actions and the extent to which so much of, of our contemporary culture, which this is why I think spirituality is so important right now, mm -hmm. that so much of our mainstream culture is materialistic and encourages us to think, you know, consumer capitalism really does encourage us to think of ourselves as animals whose highest pursuit and goal in life is, is pleasure mm -hmm. <laughs> and the accumulation of power and money. And what else could there be? We're just, we're just bodies and, you know, we're just encouraged to think of ourselves as another animal species. And this is not to put animals down. It's sure. just, if we have an eye and we have some sense of of conscience and this this connection to something eternal it seems to me that there's um there's a greater purpose a greater purpose for human life than what this um dominant materialist worldview would allow for and we do great damage not only to ourselves but also to the earth and to the spiritual world by not stepping up to the plate you know and continuing to advance our own evolution is like at this point we have to become active participants it's not going to happen for us to us um and that's the threshold that we're that's the precipice that we're um you know 
at at this moment and uh i have i have hope that we can find a way through this but i'm also um there are a lot of signs that it's not going well <laughs> right? yeah. so yeah and that was that was one of the reasons why ra felt that they could contact us we according to them it's a 75,000 year cycle uh, the third density and there are 12 major cycles and then there are 12 minor cycles within each major cycle and uh, and so Jesus the Jesus event that's a whole nother con- I mean if you were interested that's a whole nother conversation because I do have how do you blend all that and I've got some ideas on that but the Jesus Christ um, actual occasion if you will uh, is took place at the very beginning of the last minor cycle as an effort to create um, a pathway forward for humanity given our particular um, uh, collective uh, as one being our particular inability to move beyond the lower chakras and the Jesus event then would have taken say theology and philosophy that may have worked in other planets, certainly with Ra, they talked about how they were primarily a philosophical, um, very harmonious, without much negativity, um, experience of third density. And their naivete, in fact, is what, uh, they are learning third density lessons, in a sense, as a sixth density being, vis-a-vis being our helpers to get into fourth density. But the point is, is that, um, Jesus, oh wait, um, when I lose my point, <laughs> that, uh, well, let me just say it this way, that the greatest problem that we have in third density is this blockage, which Ra calls bellicosity. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's a particular attitude, a warfare type attitude that it becomes an unspoken and unacknowledged bias that even when we are, quote, doing well in our religious systems, our political systems, and say, doing the right things and checking off the boxes, the, the system itself, because it's unacknowledged or unexplored, um, is actually existing within the, the particular energetics of bellicosity. That there is an us and them, there is a scapegoat tendency that we never transcended. And even as because we are cosmically moved into Ra would say the green the heart center of the chakra of god if, if the galactic logos in the middle as one level of god let's say uh, Ra would talk about having there there being um different phases spatial vase uh, phases of uh the different chakras of god and earth has moved into the energetics of fourth density so uh, our cosmic bath water, if you will, is fourth density love and light. It is all of this. Uh, but we as a particular entity, uh, community, organism, we are not even ready for third density proper yet. We're still trying to figure out who we are, even as individual people, because the scapegoating process keeps us entrapped right down in that second chakra and so the main issues that we have are to break in to our um, sense of who are we and that's what most of my work is with counselors is like defining what do you want who are you what do you want and then how are you able to um, get a sense of hope and then can you trust the process and always i'm trying to couch this metanoia i call it metanoiaism couch it into an act of service uh, where people go and incarnate who they are um, what their sense of hope is and then uh, trusting the process which which keeps us humble you know that there is a process here that those three things actually by by very nature of the cosmic laws open up the bellicosity uh, thought form inside logjam inside each of us individually so mm-hmm. I'll, I'll just say, um, and I'll finish here and just ask you to weigh in. I want to be very respectful of your time that the way that um, I'm trying to take all of this concept in the law of one and religious stuff and all that I, I love so much in, in, in counseling 
is to basically help people and create a praxis that's somewhat codified, a little bit like you had talked about, is that there's a, there's a rubric without it being uh, bringing it into the level of um, sh- shame or <laughs> heaven or hell. But there's a rubric and it's simple and it's enter into solidarity with another. And, and that is a whole process on how to do that. I mean, that could be lots of books are written on that. Um, and I, I use several different ways to do that. But deep solidarity. And then from there, step two in metanoism is to instill a sense or cultivate um, hope, cultivating in the sense of like planting a seed or maybe watering a seed, but finding out from them vis-a-vis my relationship with them in solidarity, finding out what is the next thing that would be helpful for them in terms of expanding their sense of hope, larger perspective to which they belong into. And then the third step is to always surrender into this sense of process, which keeps us humble, that God is on process and we are on process. And I think by doing all of that, um, slowly we might move into um, a greater way to relieve that bellicosity and go into our hearts. So I don't know, what are your thoughts? And that's a lot I gave you, I'm sorry. (laughs) No, it's okay. Yeah, I like that rubric. And, you know, it seems to me, I mean, the way I think about this is that um, sort of the Christ event is this divine hand to help us um, enter into this fourth chakra heart space. But but that that Christic love doesn't uh, automatically help us heal these lower chakra issues. We have to do that. But we have this this love centered um being of flight and warmth that's here to say hey you know i'm i'm holding you through this and you got this but we got to do it (laughs) um and so that's 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 a source of uh, what gives me hope um there and i think it's it's the challenge is okay does it need to be i don't want it to become a sort of um uh, sectarian religious thing like oh you you you're saying everyone needs to become Christian no no it's not it's nothing to do with the religion um, these are spiritual realities and religions have formed around different spiritual beings and um, if you want to call it Buddhist compassion that's great I don't care <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but but I do think that there are there are these real spiritual beings mm-hmm. that we come into relationships with and they can help us in our own process of, of learning and, and growth. Um, I, I really do think just to speak to, you know, the skeptics of all of this who might think everything we've just been talking about is totally BS and in la la land that, um, human beings need story. <laughs> we need, um, we need a sense of, of a future that is, meaningful and that can elicit striving from us or the alternative if we don't have that is lethargy and um, gluttony and just getting caught up the only source of story if we don't have this this sort of this spiritual evolution to guide us into the future is is as, as a result of like nationalism and racism and these uh, conflicts between peoples that, you know, yeah, war is, war is tremendously meaningful. It gives people a sense of, of brotherhood and, and whatever, belonging to the tribe and all of this stuff that fulfills this emotional need that we have to, to belong to a purposeful project, right? And so I think we need to take seriously the importance of this and recognize um, even if you think that none of this is real, well, then let's, you know, as, who was it? I forget who said, if God did not exist, we must invent one. Um, I don't think we need to invent. I think there's plenty of reason to believe that we are participants in in a spiritual reality. Um, but one way or another, I think it's it's impossible to deny the importance of this type of inquiry, right? And so I, I just want to fully affirm the type of work you're doing with your, your clients and this particular population. I think bringing some maturity to these very new spiritual approaches i mean new within Mm -hmm. what the last 
century or, or half century or so as the new age movement sort of picked up steam yeah. um, that needs to be grounded and and worked with and matured and mm-hmm. brought into the relationship to psychodynamic processes and yeah. you know, in a therapeutic context so I, I, I think it's fantastic um, the type of work you're doing so keep thank it up <laughs> yeah thank you likewise I'm mirroring back to my admiration to you too <laughs> thank you yeah. um, well thanks so much for just taking the time out and, and chatting and th- this was really um it was fruitful for me and it was lovely to connect with you yeah likewise you know, i enjoyed uh learning more about um this cosmology and the, the law of one and and this channeled material because there's so many resonances um with you know the other traditions that i've studied um and and with whitehead's philosophy so it's great to see that type of sort of independent convergence upon the same the same themes awesome to the brother well thank you so much and take care have a wonderful day all right doug you too thanks bye-bye bye